My name is uh, Joe Kuttner, and I am the JVM Languages owner at Heroku. Heroku is a cloud-based deployment platform uh, for building and running web applications. It supports a number of different programming languages, including Ruby, PHP, Python, and of course, Java. But not just Java, all the JVM languages, or at least most of them, the important ones. Uh, and today, uh, I'm, I'm going to focus on Java itself, but the principles and techniques that I talk about, they, they really apply to all these different languages. Now, if, you, uh, if you've been using Java and you're interested in deploying on Heroku, I suspect your first question for me would be, how do I deploy my WAR file? Or where do I put the WAR file? And before I tell you how to do this, I want to ask a question. Why do we deploy as WAR files? Uh, I suspect that the answer is because that's the way we've always done it. And yeah, like I think I've probably been deploying WAR files for 10 or more years. It's, it's, uh, it's been around for a while. It's, it's the way we did it uh, long ago, before the cloud, before virtualization. Uh, but things have changed. We're not deploying to a, a server in a closet down the hall anymore. And WAR file deployment introduces a, a number of different problems. Uh, one of the most important, I think, is that it can be very difficult to get your development environment functioning exactly the same way as your production environment. And this is a problem because it makes it difficult to uh, diagnose and debug problems in production, but it also makes it really easy to introduce problems into production because you didn't you know, notice them in development. It also leads to a, a thing I call configuration proliferation, where you end up with configuration for your, uh, your web container, uh, XML files strewn about, uh, configuration for the platform that the web container runs on, and then sometimes configuration in the WAR file itself. Uh, and that just leads to uh, inconsistencies in how we deploy. So before I tell you how to deploy WAR files on Heroku, which you can do, I want to talk about what modern Java deployment looks like. And in one word, it's containerless. So rather than deploying an archive file into a running servlet container, we take our code, compile it, or push it up to the cloud where it compiles and it gets run. Now that, I, I, that may leave a few of you with you know, scratching your heads, especially if you've been doing Java development for a while. But what it really amounts to is running your application, not deploying your application, but just running it directly. So before I uh, try to explain that anymore, I'd like to just show you what that means. So what I have here is a very simple Spring Boot application. This is like the simplest, this is the only file, the only class file. This is about the simplest Spring Boot application you can have. It has a single route uh, for, uh, for the home route, mapping it to this home HTML file. But the real important part here is, oh no, spinning wheel. Well, the important part here is this, uh, this main method, uh, which is the entry point for the application. And I'm hoping I'll get this to run. Oh, dear. Well, um, that main method starts up spring, so there's no no uh, dropping this uh, war file into a container. The container is provided for us by Spring. Uh, let's see if I can get out of there. Thanks a lot, QuickTime. Oh, it's not going to have any luck. All right. Well, what I was going to show you is that this application has, uh, it's a standard Maven application. It has a POM file, uh, and that POM file simply has a dependency on Spring Boot. And Spring Boot has implicit dependencies on the uh, other things like Tomcat that we need to run our application. Good Lord. Ah, boy. Give me one second. Oh, that's too bad. Let's do this. Um, 
I was having internet trouble, so that's why I recorded it, and now I'm having this trouble. So I'll just try and run this uh, directly. Okay, so I can, uh, so here's my POM file. Uh, I don't know if you can see this. There, that's better. All right, so here are the, uh, the Spring Boot dependencies. Uh, but what's really important about this POM file is that it has a system property of the start class. And what this tells Spring Boot is that this is the, the class, the only class in our application that has an entry point. This is how it, how it runs. Now, uh, I could run this application locally, but instead I'm just going to run it on Heroku. Uh, so the first step in doing that is running Heroku create. The Heroku command is provided by a by a tool belt uh, toolkit that we have. And uh, we use this to create an application, provision the application, and as part of that application, it creates a Git repository. So I can then uh, make changes to my code. Uh, in this case, I'll just make an empty commit. And then push it up to the Heroku repository in the cloud. That push action is the deploying of my application. So Heroku detects, oh, come on. <laughs> All right, so that push action is the, uh, the deploying of the application. When Heroku receives the code from our Git repository, uh, it detects that it's a Java application. It'll run the Maven command to, uh, uh, to package it up, and then ultimately just, just to run it. Let's see if any of these other commands work. OK, so once the application is running, uh, it runs in what we call a dyno. And a dyno is Heroku speak for a highly isolated process uh, that, that has everything our application needs to run. Uh, it's, as you can see here, it is basically a Java command. So it's that java-jar command that I was talking about earlier. Now on Heroku, we can actually uh, scale these application instances up and down with the, the same command. So I can scale them down if traffic, traffic is subsiding, or scale them back up if, if we're at a time of, uh, of peak traffic. And then when I list them again, you can see there's just one running. Um, you can also get a history of your deployments with the Heroku releases command. So if you deploy changes via Git that are breaking, your application goes down, you can immediately roll back to a previous version of the application and then do your forensics or de debugging in a, in a separate, uh, separate app. Hmm. All right, there's a lot more I'd like to show with that, but I'll have to skip it. So that still leaves the question, how do I deploy the war file, right? Well, there's two ways to deploy a war file on Heroku. One is just simply with the Heroku command, deploying your war file. It'll push the war file up and run it inside of a Tomcat container. Uh, the other way is sort of a middle ground, where we're still running a Java command, but we're using uh, either Jetty Runner or uh, the Tomcat web app runner uh, to start up our app, sort of in a container-like container, container -like mode, but still with a Java command. Now. This containerless approach is really what's, what's being embraced by the community. So Spring and Spring Boot are uh, looking towards this executable model. Uh, the Play framework uh, doesn't really support war files at all. Uh, all your applications are run. They're executed rather than deployed as a war file. And uh, other things like Finagle from Twitter, a Scala-based web framework, are all emphasizing this embedded server approach. Now, when doing this, you gain certain characteristics of your app that make it more scalable. Uh, but to really maximize that, uh, we recommend at Heroku this, this philosophy of the 12-factor app. So the 12-factor app is uh, um, it's a manifesto. It's a methodology. It's, it's really just a collection of experiences that the founders of Heroku identified after years of deploying applications of all different kinds. And the goals of this manifesto are scalability, maintainability, and portability. Uh, now, these are things that are not unfamiliar to, uh, to Java developers, uh, but 
the 12 factor app goes about them in, in a slightly different way. It achieves these things by emphasizing declarative setups through explicit dependencies and, and uh, external configuration, clean contracts between your application and its platform, which reduces the coupling between your app and its platform, and then a minimum divergence between deployments and also between your development, production, uh, and every environment in between. So these are the 12 factors of a 12 factor app. And uh, they're, some of them are nouns, some of them are verbs. So I don't really know how to define what a factor is. But it's more like a tenant, a tenant of a good application. So I'm going to run over these one by one. And the first factor is code base. Uh, and in the 12 factor app, your application should have a single code base that gets deployed multiple times. So this is opposed to uh, composing your application out of multiple code bases that are pulled together uh, at, at runtime or, or, at, or in production. And just as I uh, ran git push Heroku ma master earlier, uh, you can do this on Heroku with different remote targets. So uh, an application for testing, an application for staging, and uh, an application for production. The second factor is dependencies, which should be declared explicitly. And this is, again, if you're using Maven or something like that, not, probably not unfamiliar. Uh, we're used to doing this with uh, uh, commons libraries, JDBC libraries. If you're using Scala and SBT, it might be done this way. But what it also means is that your, uh, your servlet container, your server, should be one of your dependencies. So in the Spring Boot example, uh, the, the uh, Spring Boot was our dependency, and it has, had an implicit dependency on Tomcat or Jetty. But in other applications, you might have uh, an explicit dependency on Jetty or maybe Twitter's Finagle if you're using Scala. The third factor is configuration. Uh, in the 12-factor app, you should store your configuration in the environment, not in the application. So what that means is that rather than having you know, JDBC URLs in XML files somewhere, maybe in your WAR file, maybe in your server container. Uh, these configuration elements should all be in one place in the environment. And so, for example, that might mean getting your database URL as part of a, an environment variable. And Heroku makes it very easy to set these kinds of things with uh, the Heroku tool belt, running something like Heroku config to set Java options uh, that will be picked up when your application starts up. The fourth factor is backing services should be treated as attachable resources. Um, and this is you know, pretty normal in, a, in, in the Java world, especially if you're using something like JNDI. But the Heroku platform provides a really robust add-ons marketplace with uh, all sorts of add-ons that provide data stores like Postgres, Redis, Memcache, but also external services for telephony, uh, publishing S SMS messages, or, uh, uh, storing and analyzing log files. And these add-ons can be uh, composed into your applications with a single command. Uh, in this case, add-ons add paper trail. Paper trail is an add-on that captures logs and allows you to do some analytics with them. The fifth factor is uh, build, release, and run, which in the Java world we have to do because we have to compile our applications. But what's really important about this is that it should be a single step. And again, that's, if you're using Maven, that's typically uh, something like Maven package might be what you run. But there's more than just compilation. There's, there's delivering the application code, running the application code. And on Heroku, that all happens in a single step, and that is the, the git push Heroku master. Uh, we're also starting to, to release things like an SBT plugin that uh, still does the same thing uh, in a single step, but works, but integrates directly with uh, build tools like SBT or Maven. The next factor is processes should be stateless. Uh, so in the Java world, uh, this, is, this is pretty well understood for us. It's a multi-threaded platform, so we understand the consequences of uh, having state among different threads or different processes. But the one area where I see this often uh, mixed up is in writing to the local file system. So on Heroku, writing to the local file system isn't supported because that is, in fact, uh, a way of keeping state between processes. So in, in the 12-factor app, instead of writing local files, you need to attach resources, uh, as I mentioned before, and, uh, or just store things in the database. The seventh factor is uh, port binding. All of your application services should be exposed by binding to a port. 
What's Im particularly important about this is that your application should do the binding and not depend on a container uh, to, to inject this at runtime. So if you noticed in those uh, Java commands I showed earlier that we're actually passing that, that port into the application so that it can bind to it. The next factor is concurrency. Uh, your application should be able to scale out as well as up. Traditionally, Java applications are very good at scaling up. That's, that's what they were built to do. But you should also be able to scale out. And scaling out means creating more application processes. And that's what I did with the uh, Heroku PS command earlier. And that's a great way to get more processes. But it's also important to, uh, to scale by uh, breaking down your, or, or creating workload diversity. So breaking down the parts of your application that do different jobs so that you can scale them independently. So if you have a, a set of workers that run background tasks periodically, uh, when your website's traffic increases, you may not need to scale those. You need to scale the part of your application that handles web requests. The next factor is disposability. Uh, your application should be able to start up quickly and shut down gracefully. If you're using something like Spring Boot or Play, this is essentially handled for you. Uh, it's really as opposed to big app servers like WebSphere or something like that that take uh, several minutes to boot uh, before they actually start binding to a port and handling requests. This is an important factor because it's what allows your application to, to uh, scale quickly and respond, respond to demand very quickly. And also scale down as well because uh, when uh, traffic subsides, you don't want to continue paying for those extra instances. Uh, the next factor is dev prod parity. So as I mentioned before, in war file deployment, this can be a tricky subject. But in general, it's best to keep your development environment your, your, uh, looking exactly like your production environment and all the environments in between looking identical. Uh, the most common place where I see this rule violated is in database usage. So if you are using Postgres in production, you should be using it in staging and you should be using it in development. This is the best way to ensure that you find problems early uh, and don't introduce uh, new regressions. The next factor is logging. Now, logging may seem kind of benign, but it's actually kind of important. So most people think, or most applications treat logs as files that reside on a server somewhere. But in the 12-factor app, they should be treated as event streams. So all of these application processes, uh, including your database processes, uh, should be generating logs as events. And on Heroku, these events are captured and, and filtered through a common event stream. And that event stream can then be uh, uh, searched and filtered, uh, providing a good single view for the, uh, for the application. I can't tell you on how many applications I've worked that don't do this, that I've spent a lot of time hopping around on, you know, from server to server looking at different log files. And this can save a lot of grief. All right, the last factor is admin processes, which should be, uh, these kinds of tasks should be treated as one-off processes. You should not be logging into a production application uh, to run a quick command that uh, does something to the, to the database. I can tell you from experience, that's a really good way to bring down your application. Uh, instead, uh, app admin tasks should be run as one-off processes. And on Heroku, uh, these admin tasks are treated just like any other process. So your web processes, your worker processes, they're a copy of your application. And your admin tasks are the same way. This is the best way to provide isolation for those tasks and ensure that uh, you're not mucking with the, the production and web instances. All right, so the 12 factors, again, are uh, code base. You should have a single code base for your application with multiple deploys. Dependency should be explicit. Configuration should be external to your app. Backing services should be treated as attachable resources. You should be able to build, release, and run in a single step. Processes should be stateless. Uh, you should bind to ports explicitly and not depend on a, a container to inject them. Uh, concurrency, you should be able to scale up as well as out. Your app should be disposable. Uh, it should start up quickly and shut down gracefully. Uh, your dev and prod environments sh uh, should have parity. They should look uh, function essentially the same. Uh, and log files should be treated as events, and admin tasks should be uh, run as one-off processes. I am going to give my little video thing one more try, because I did want to show you the Heroku dashboard. No, it's not going to work. 
So maybe I can just show it to you the old-fashioned way. <laughs> Okay, so the Heroku dashboard. Each of these, uh, each of these rows here is a, a Heroku application in my account. So if I open up one of them, this I can tell this is a Scala application. So you can see the web command that's being run and the port is being passed in. Uh, much of what I was doing in the uh, uh, from the command line can also be done from this Heroku dashboard. So I can, uh, instead of using the Heroku PS command, I can scale up my application by moving this slider. And when I save that, it'll immediately start up new dynos, uh, which are application processes. Uh, I can also configure add-ons here. So this is, uh, by default, I'll have a, I should have a uh, uh, Postgres, but I can also get to many other add-ons from here. I can control access to my application, so right now I'm the only user. But uh, if this was a development instance, I might add other developers who could also push to this Git repository uh, and create new releases. I can view the activity on the application, see when deploys were made. Uh, and I can adjust settings, like changing the name of the application, but also setting configuration variables, which are those environment variables, such as the database URL or any other uh, environment configuration. I think the most interesting thing here, though, is I can view metrics for my application. And this is not being used, so it doesn't have any metrics. These metrics are, let's see if I can find one here. Um, here we go. James Ward's. No, it doesn't have any more. OK, well, it looked like that on the right side, but it's, it's a lot more robust. You can get a, uh, a real-time view without writing any code of uh, uh, trends for request, uh, request timeouts, CPU usage, memory usage. Uh, and you can use these to help determine where, your, where the pain points are in your application. So if you start to see request timeouts that coincide with spikes in CPU usage, uh, you might know that you need to scale up. If you're uh, receiving more requests than you can handle, you need to scale out. So the uh, Heroku application can be scaled out by uh, increasing the number of dynos, uh, but it can also be scaled up by increasing the, or, or adding more resources to each dyno. So a dyno by default starts with uh, a half a gig of RAM and uh, one CPU, but that can be scaled up to several gigs of RAM and, and multiple CPUs. All right. I think I will open it up for questions. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, I have uh, the code for that Spring Boot example is uh, on the web on GitHub. Uh, you can find out more about deploying Java applications on Heroku at the Dev Center. Uh, and the slides for this talk are on SlideShare. And I go by Codefinger on Twitter and IRC. All right, thank you for bearing with me. I'm sorry that the, uh, the demo didn't work out too perfectly. Uh, but I'll, if you have questions, uh, I think come up to the front here, and I'll be happy to answer them.